Hi and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review of Galaxy Quest. In this video I'll give my thoughts on the 1999 science fiction comedy film Galaxy Quest. This video is a Patreon requested video requested by patron Allison Fordyce. So Galaxy Quest was quite a uh, unique movie released in 1999 with a silly and yet brilliant premise. The premise that there's a group of has-been actors from a long-canceled science fiction TV show that aired over 18 years ago who go on a convention circuit for the show which still has a very devoted fan base. But this group of actors gets transported into space by actual space aliens who receive transmissions of the show but have no concept of what fiction is so interpreted them as historical documents and so recreated the ship of the TV show perfectly. So these actors have to try to free these aliens from the oppression of an evil alien force and this is hilarious. This is the kind of out there premise uh, that I could see how this could have easily gone wrong. So the fact that they all managed to come together so well with comedy that works really well throughout the film and a storyline that is engaging enough that by the end of the film it makes you want to get up and cheer and it is a real feel good movie. Now, Galaxy Quest obviously takes some influence from Star Trek, which also helped push these movies into cult status rather than just being another forgettable family action comedy, as the cast of Galaxy Quest is meant to resemble the cast of Star Trek. In fact, one could almost assume the only reason the show in the film is called Galaxy Quest and not Star Trek is because of rights. There are many parallels, such as a classic sci-fi show that was canceled years ago, having a fully uh, devoted fan base with regular conventions. Uh, Tim Allen's uh, Jason Nav uh, Nesmith is obviously based off of William Shatner, has an actor who played the captain and is known for being egotistical and self-centered and having this speech with his castmates. And there were a lot of other story threads and character traits in the film, obviously lifted from the original original series of Star Trek. All that being said though, Star Trek wasn't the only influence on the film. For one thing, there are also elements of some other Star Trek spin-offs incorporated into the film, but also more importantly, this could be said to apply to any science fiction show that gained cult status, uh, be it Lost in Space or the original Battlestar Galactica and even non-space science fiction shows like Quantum Leap and The X-Files. And retroactively, watching the film now, you can see that this applies to other shows that were released after the film was made, such as Firefly and Farscape. So while the Star Trek influence is undeniable, I'm still very resistant to those that refer to this as a Star Trek movie when clearly it's not. It's a comedy that is clearly parodying Star Trek, but that doesn't make it a Star Trek movie. I've seen some reviewers include this in a series of Star Trek film reviews, and apparently at a big Star Trek convention earlier this decade, fans were asked to rate all of the Star Trek films, and this film was included in the list along with the other 12 at the time Star Trek films that actually have the word Star Trek in the title. And in my humble opinion, that's a bit ridiculous. For one thing, uh, in the film Galaxy Quest, the show was said to air in the early 80s, and there was no Star Trek show that aired in the early 80s. The Galaxy Quest show itself was a lot cheesier and simplistic than any Star Trek series, which again is something any parody would do because it really increases the comedic factor. And as I mentioned, there are influences with different Star Trek series as well as other science fiction shows, so it's clearly not a one-to-one -one analogy, so I reject the notion that this is a Star Trek film in any way, shape, or form. That's kind of like calling Hot Shots a Top Gun film, or National Lampoon's uh, Loaded Weapon 1 a Lethal Weapon film, or Scary Movie a Scream film, and so on and so forth. And if your response was to say, well, yeah, I do consider Hot Shots a Top Gun film, then stop it! <laughs> that is categorically incorrect. There is a difference between parodies and films that they're parodying. I ran into this problem currently with the Orville where many try to present it as a Star Trek show when clearly it's a Star Trek parody and there's a clear difference. I heard one retort stating, well the only reason the Orville doesn't use the Star Trek name and the other titles of Star Trek is because have issues having to do with rights. 
fine, that's fair, but it, it didn't get the right, so regardless of how much you like the show or how much you think it's better than the other shows that do have the name Star Trek, it doesn't matter. It still officially is not Star Trek, and that's just the way it is. But the thing with Galaxy Quest is it clearly isn't trying to be a Star Trek film, and very clearly wants to be a parody, and has a parody, I think it works absolutely amazing. And I don't think there are any clear one-to-one -one comparisons to Star Trek. Well, maybe other than Tim Allen's character being like William Shatner, <laughs> that's pretty one-to-one. -one. But other than that, aspects typically take inspiration from a variety of sources. For example, in her email to me, Alison Fordyce, who requested this review, stated that she heard that Alan Rickman's character, Alexander Dane, was based off of Patrick Stewart, which she disagreed with, stating that the character seemed more based off of Leonard Nimoy. And to be honest, that's exactly how I always thought of this character, as Nimoy tried to distance himself from Trek, writing a book called I Am Not Spock, and seemed unhappy with the fact that there was that he was only remembered for that one role and was trying so hard to be uh, remembered for other things. He also for a while tried to distance himself from Star Trek, refusing to appear in the proposed Star Trek Phase 2 TV show, and apparently only agreeing to appear in The Wrath of Khan if his character was killed off, although he does deny that claim, some still make it. And of course, Alexander and Jason were taken directly from the disputes between Nimoy and Shatner. But that being said, there were definitely elements of Patrick Stewart incorporated into Alan Rickman's character, such as him being a British Shakespearean actor that is not comfortable with science fiction. So this is what I mean by not being a straight one-to-one -one comparison. And looking at the other characters there, Sigourney Weaver, uh, her character Gwen DeMarco, who I think is an amalgamation of the portrayal of women in classic science fiction shows across the board and is not a one-on-one -on -one depiction of a horror, and is an amalgamation of how women are marginalized and often sexualized in classic sci-fi shows. She's kind of like a horror in that she simply answers the phone and repeats what the computer says, but a horror actually had a lot more to do than simply repeating what the computer said, and in my opinion wasn't as sexualized as Gwen is in Galaxy Quest. In fact, there were elements of Gwen's highly sexualized attributes that could be said to be taken from Star Trek Voyager's Seven of Nine. For example, in the film, Gwen states that there was a five-page TV Guide article all about how her boobs fit into her tight costume, which indeed there was an article about Jerry Ryan, who plays Seven of Nine, and TV Guide all about how her boobs fit into her tight outfit. And there's also uh, Tommy Weber, who appeared as the child pilot in the uh, original Galaxy Quest show. And this is obviously meant as commentary on Wesley Crusher from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. But like any good parody would do, it exaggerates this for comedic effect. Has rather than having a teenager driving the ship, it's a child that <laughs> pilots a spaceship. And it comes off as much sillier, but... In, and doing so, it highlights how silly having a teenager at the helm of a starship is. And then we have a Fred Kwan, who played the chief engineer, and this character is the one I think who least resembles any specific Star Trek character, and he's kind of a new introdu introduced element into the film, one in which I think really increases the comedic aspects of the film, as Kwan has a constant attitude that I think is best described as detached, as when his fellow cast members are freaking out uh, at being thrust into a real-life space adventure, and Tim Allen's character is basking and enjoying it, Fred Kwan takes it in stride, as if it's just any other day. In fact, his attitude is so nonchalant, he comes off as stoned. And I often wondered if that is the intention of the filmmakers, and that they simply didn't show him doing drugs in an attempt to keep the film family friendly. I mean, after all, doing drugs is a common trait of Hollywood actors, particularly the so-called has-beens. In fact, Sam Rockwell's character at one point even straight out asks him, are you stoned? To which he doesn't answer. In fact, I think that's kind of purposely ambiguous, but I wouldn't be surprised if the direction that he was given from the director was act stoned, because that's how he comes off. But again, I think this really adds to the comedy of the film. 
And speaking of Sam Rockwell's character, let's get into the other wild card who I think was an interesting inclusion, uh, was to include an actor who played a random crew member killed in one episode. In short, a red shirt. They never used the term red shirt in the film, but really that's what he is. And again, this allows for some great comedy as he thinks he's going to be a red shirt in real life adventure and that he's going to be the first to die. But what's also interesting about this character is that unlike the other main cast member, he's actually a fan of the show and doesn't just consider it another job. And this comes out throughout the movie as he's able to point out many aspects of the show that relates to the current uh, predicament, which was hilarious. So in addition to the main cast, we also have uh, the aliens who take them on an adventure, who are of course an invention of the film and unlike the other characters serve less as an allegory for Star Trek actors and more are there to service the plot of the film. However, I think they really had the, uh, you know, they really did up the comedy aspect of the film and because these characters came off as hilarious. And I love that the writers were wise enough to realize how ridiculous the premise of the film was and not try to play these characters straight or serious. And with them, they completely embrace the absurdity of it all, such as the way they said things like, we need your help. Uh, the way they talked and behaved was very obviously alien, but in a silly and funny sort of way rather than a serious or scary way. And I think that was totally what was needed. What I thought worked particularly well was the way they all laughed all the time or what sounded like laughter, but you never knew what emotion they were actually expressing. Uh, sometimes it could be fear or anger. The best use of this, in my opinion, was when... Uh, was when Jason and Gwen were trying to explain that they were just from a TV show, and this brought up the concept of lies and deception, which was a new concept to them, and they expressed that if uh, the Galaxy Quest crew were capable of lying the way Ceres did, and then they trailed off to this weird laughter thing, which was actually quite menacing in that context. Of course, uh, these were all plot devices to keep our group of actors on the ship, but I think they used them very well in a very uh, effective comedic way. And overall, I found their demeanor of appearing to smile all the time, even though maybe they weren't actually happy, was actually quite hilarious. But then there's the villains who, to be honest, I didn't really care for at all and were indeed just there to keep the plot going and weren't at all interesting nor particularly believable. And the main villain, Cyrus, is kind of two-dimensional evil bad guy that Star Trek never actually really had, as typically they were more dynamic than that. But that's okay because this is a parody after all, and therefore it's mainly there just to push the plot forward, which isn't actually the point of the film point of the film is the comedy but I do love the inclusion of the fanboy characters at first it may come off as insulting as they come off as really geeky losers but by the end of the movie their devotion to the show is what ends up saving the day and I love how Jason has to admit that he was wrong to treat his fans like that and it's the fans that ended up saving him many have noted that it makes the movie more of a love letter to fans and it's their devotion that keeps shows like this alive so I love that this is a lesson that Jason needs to learn at the end of the day. Another great thing about the film is the commentary it makes on these sci-fi TV shows and how sometimes the writing is a bit contrived in order to create tension. And when these aliens create an actual ship based off of a TV show, some of the issues are brought into reality. The biggest example of this is the Chompers, which is a completely unnecessary and ridiculous plot point that was just written into the TV show to create tension. And in real life, it serves 
no purpose whatsoever. I absolutely loved how the whole time Gun was shouting that she's going to kill whoever wrote that episode. And of course, there's the deactivation device uh, when they're trying to avert the core overload where it had to wait until it got down uh, to the number one before it actually stopped because that's what always happens in the TV show. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant. And just other moments like that that called out some typical cliches seen not just in Star Trek but all kinds of film and television. However, there was the big MacGuffin in the film about the Omega-13 device, which I thought was actually entirely unnecessary and a bit contrived. Uh, for the purposes of the story of, of, the, you know, of the movie, no one knew exactly what it did, but if this is actually based off of a TV show, it would have... It would have been used in that TV show. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been introduced in the show. Also, everyone kept saying, oh, it could destroy the universe. But as soon as Justin Long's character was like, well, I and many others think it could reverse time for 13 seconds. Uh, it's so obvious that that's what it would do. And by the way, it ended up reversing time for, for a full minute, not just 13 seconds. But anyway, in any event, uh, the fact uh, Jason would risk destroying the entire universe just to save his life and the life of his friends seemed a bit selfish to me to say the least but whatever i actually think that the whole scene at the end was sars killing everyone on the bridge and then jason having to use the omega 13 device to reverse time and undo all of that was entirely unnecessary they could have just written this whole thing out of the script not had the omega 13 device not have this scene where Ceres kills everyone and the movie would be just fine i mean just have Ceres beam onto the ship at the end and then he appears at the convention where jason does his role and kill him that's all you need you don't need that other stuff with the omega 13 device but whatever so my rating for Galaxy Quest, out of 10 is a 9 excellent. What made Galaxy Quest so good wasn't just that it was hilarious, and the heart that it had uh, was really fascinating, well-developed characters with some well-structured character arcs, and the base plot, ridiculous as it was, was actually really engaging, as by the end of the film it was so feel-good it made you want to get up and cheer. So it's actually much more, much more than a simple Star Trek parody, and in fact, I think, to reduce it to just that kind of diminishes it. It's its own thing in its own right that's a fun, funny sci-fi action-adventure comedy romp. It isn't perfect though, it's more of a family film and sometimes can go off, come off as a bit too simplistic and there are some unnecessary MacGuffins, but overall a great time can be had with this film which was well structured and well put together. So that's it for my review of Galaxy Quest. Thanks again to Patreon Allison Fordyce for supporting the channel and suggesting this video. If you'd like to support the channel on Patreon, there's a link in the description below. Uh, awards include monthly schedules for planned videos and a series of patron-only videos that I'm doing. I just completed my top three best and worst director's cut or extended editions of my favorite films. And now I have moved on to my top 10 favorite and least favorite film directors list. Also, if you select the $10 or more option, you can request videos like this one. So also be sure to check out my channel for many more videos on other shows like Star Trek, Game of Thrones, The Expanse, Discovery, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.